Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you tune in. Welcome to Conversations Over Coffee or Coffee Conversations. Today we are here with Peter. He's going to tell us a bit about him. We're going to learn many, many things about science, photography maybe, uh, and even animals. Um, so I'm very excited to, to, to talk to Peter. Um, but first, I wanted to ask Peter, how, how do you pronounce your name? I, I don't want to make any mistakes. Hi, Larissa. Um, Hi. Just call me Peter. Peter's fine. Just call me uh, Peter, but I want, I want to know exactly how to pronounce your name. Well, it's a Polish name, and, and it's a tough one to pronounce. So the actual mm -hmm. pronunciation is Piotr Naskrensky. Very few people can pronounce it. But uh, <laughs> so I go by Peter, and Peter's fine. Good. Thank you, Peter. That's much better. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, please stay tuned in. Uh, we have questions at the end. And of course, we also have, we will have a winner after um, the question section. Um, let's start by asking who, who is Peter? Okay. Well, my name is Peter Nasgrecki, as we've already established. Um, I am an entomologist, biologist, conservation biologist, and I, uh, I'm an, also an as the associate director of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory in Gorongosa, and that's where I am uh, right now. And I'm wearing this mask to protect myself from the harmful computer arrays that probably also <laughs> transmit the virus. I'm actually shocked that that theory is not somewhere on the internet yet. But so better okay, safe so, than sorry. Are you advising that everyone should be wearing masks even when they hold the hand? Everybody should be wearing masks at all times. And I'm quite serious. Oh, wow. That's that's probably the best thing that you can do right now. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you for the advice. I, I didn't know that. Um and I will try to always wear a mask in the next lives. I don't have one nearby, otherwise I would have um worn it. Um well, what was your dream as a child? Um, to be in this very place where I'm sitting right now, quite honestly. I've always wanted to be a biologist. I wanted to work with animals and plants, and I always wanted to live in a really, really cool place. And I cannot think of a cooler place than Gorongosa here in, in Mozambique. Um, so I, I essentially became uh, a biologist the moment I started to, to walk, even probably before I I was able to talk and say anything. I was, I, as far as I remember, as for as long as I remember, I've been fascinated with uh, living things, uh, all kinds of organisms. Um, and so my dream was to be a biologist, to be a biologist, to, to work in, a, in an interesting place. And uh, that's how I ended up here in the end. Nice. So this is the, the fulfillment of all my dreams. Oh, that's good. That's very yeah, good. I am very happy. <laughs> good. That that's it's it's really good when you when you feel accomplished and that you you are making your dreams uh, become real. That that's very good. Well, I don't know about the, I don't know about the accomplished part, but at least <laughs> I am at the place where I always wanted to be. And now well, I will I'm, try. I'm, to I'm talking about a, a, a interesting fact that I just read that you won some photography competition. So I, I, I want to, to hear a bit about that part also. Well, let's focus on what was in that picture. So uh, one of my, of my photos uh, uh, was featured in the, uh, a big picture competition that is organized every year by the California Academy of Sciences. And it's considered a, a, a significant competition for natural history photography. And I was extremely happy uh, to see that my photo of a bat from Gorongosa uh, won one of, one of the categories. And uh, I was super excited because that was the Mozambican long-fingered bat that wow. probably has never been featured publicly anywhere. So, yeah. so thanks to that, people were able to see this amazing animal and it gave a little bit of, of uh, more exposure to our amazing uh, Gorongosa biodiversity. 
Oh yeah, and it's it's a beautiful photo. I um, we will have that photo um, on on our Grown Goza page, so stay tuned. Um, what about the pandemic? How 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 is that? How is your quarantine been? How's work been during this uh, pandemic? Well, we are coping. I mean, we are extremely uh, fortunate that Mozambique has been uh, dealing with the pandemic uh, quite well uh, compared to other places. Uh, uh, we don't have that many cases here, uh, thankfully. Yeah. Um, obviously, nobody knows what the future uh, will bring, but but so far uh, it's 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 relatively okay. We are getting ready. This beautiful mask that I'm wearing, <laughs> it's made out of uh, Mozambican capulana, and yeah. we are busy uh, in the park making those masks, making hundreds and thousands of those masks that will be or and already are being distributed to communities around Gorongosa to help them uh, you know uh, uh, lower the risk of of uh, of infection yeah. uh, other than that you know things are obviously had to slow down a little bit um uh, that one of the unfortunate uh uh side effects of this of this pandemic is that we had to put on pause our educational program um yeah. as marissa as you know we have a a really extensive educational program in Gorongosa that, among other things, includes um, a master's degree program in conservation biology. Yeah, uh, we have we have uh, twelve brilliant students who joined us here in uh, the beginning of March, and unfortunately, because uh, all schools are closed now in Mozambique, uh, we had to send them home. That yeah. obviously doesn't mean that they are not learning. Uh, I actually I am uh, still. Um, Teaching, I, I do online courses. Uh, uh, we interact via uh, you know computer, and um, and we we actually today is the last day of of a course that I that I was teaching, um, and it it works it works fine, but obviously it's not the same as being in the feeling being in the field, uh, you know, doing hands on things, yeah, and being together and, and so on, yeah. Um, so, so yes, I mean, obviously the pandemic has impacted our operations, but, but you know, we are trying to cope with that and we are trying to do uh, other things uh, that, that we can. Uh, for example, our, uh, we are doing a lot of work in, the, in our lab, in the, in the Wilson lab. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, uh, doing a lot of molecular work um, and uh, we are also doing, you know, other work with, with insects and so on. And um, actually, uh, in a couple of days, uh, our small group of, of scientists um, who are still here, uh, uh, these are all Mozambican scientists, uh, we will be going into the field uh, to set up some camera traps, uh, set up a weather station, uh, do some observation on observations on bats and insects, uh, collect some samples and so on. So we will be, we, we are still working, uh, unfortunately, we cannot interact directly with with our students, and and the park is closed to visitors, and and scientists from the from the outside, unfortunately. Yeah, but that sounds exciting that you guys uh, get to go to the field and do at least some work there. Yeah, no, I can definitely think of a lot of worse places to be stuck in uh, during the pandemic. I am I am not complaining in, 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 in any way. I am that's, very that's happy. That's what that I wanted to ask. Why, why did you choose to prefer to stay than, than actually go um, elsewhere? Well, several reasons. Uh, you know, uh, I had a choice of go going to, you know, for example, to spend my time uh, with my family yeah, I decided not to because in order to get there, my family is in Poland. I would have to travel through several major international hubs. Yeah, and I was afraid that I would pick, <laughs> I would pick up that virus on my way, and that during was during the trip. Uh, was, yeah, was yeah, too risky. Uh, I could have also gone to my house, which is somewhere else. But then again, there were some logistical issues with that. But but mostly. I knew that if I stay here, I will be able to to work, and I will be yeah. able to contribute more, uh, you know, for for my for my students, for um, you know these young Mozambican scientists, uh, Ricardo, Norina, Laura, with whom I work here. Yeah. So it was. I, I believe that I made the right decision to stay here and continue working. I'm sure everyone is happy to have you there, also. 
and keeping them busy as well during the, the, the quarantine. So tell us a bit about your story with Gorongosa. When did you join? Why did you join? Um, as most very important things in life, that happened uh, by a sheer uh, accident. Um, <laughs> I, I knew uh, Professor Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. He is my, my colleague in, at the uh, Department of or uh, 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 at, at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, where okay. I was working uh, uh, at that time when, you know, it was in 2012. I just happened to walk into his office one day and he asked me, hey, would you like to go with, with me to Mozambique? And I said, well, why not? And, um, and, and when I came here, I found this unbelievable place, one of the most interesting places that I've ever seen and I met this amazing guy named Greg Carr, who was doing these yeah. fantastic things here, uh, rebuilding, restoring this this park. And um, he asked me if I would like to join the team. And I hesitated for about three milliseconds and said, <laughs> "Yeah." Uh, and then, uh, and then, of course, um, I started working here to develop uh, the the science infrastructure here. Um, we already, obviously, Gorongos already had the science department, but we needed uh, a more developed facilities. Um, and uh, in 2014, we opened the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory uh, that since then has become one of the uh, most active scientific centers, um, at least in, in any protected area in Africa and probably yeah. in the world. Um, and uh, we expanded our uh, activity from ju just doing pure research to education. Uh, and uh, uh, a couple of years ago or three years ago, we started our um, uh, master's degree program, which is uh, and, uh, uh, taking place entirely entirely within uh, the national park. That's the only, the only such program in the world where the students who train to be uh, conservation biologists do it within a national park uh, interact they interact daily with every department of the park uh they can get this hands-on experience here and so I, we think that this is a, a a fantastic opportunity um to help uh create a new generation of mozambican conservationists yeah that's that's very interesting and uh i think because we have so many departments and so many things going on in the park that they are able to have this integration and get to to have all hands on at the same place uh what 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 do you um uh how can i say what is the interaction that you guys have with the coffee project well first of all we drink a lot of it <laughs> cheers i am seriously drinking gorongosa coffee right now it, it's this is not fake this is not a prop this is actual <laughs> gorongosa coffee which i love well Good, so I'm we do a lot like of it. things yeah, we do a lot of things with, with Gorongosa coffee. Um, uh, for example, um, we we look at the, well, first of all, let's start with the why Gorongosa coffee project came to be in the first place. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, multiple reasons for that. Uh, one very important reason is it really helps the communities on, on Mount Gorongosa. Yeah. It provided uh, those communities with an alternative to this traditional um, what used to be primarily slash and burn ag agriculture, very low productivity, uh, very inefficient. Gorongosa coffee uh, provides them with, uh, you know, a phenomenal cash crop that yep. truly uh, changes uh, the, for, for the better the lives of those communities. But at the same time, this is a conservation project. Uh, we chose to uh, to grow shade grown coffee because because while we are generating income for the communities, we are also reforesting uh, Mount Gorongosa. The Mount Gorongosa, yeah, yeah. Right. So so one of the projects, for example, that the science department uh, has developed is the uh, is uh, um, a project to monitor the effectiveness of that approach. We are we are looking at. Is it really working? Uh, can yeah. we show that um, the shade-grown coffee plantations actually help biodiversity? Yeah. And sh sure enough, they do. Uh, one of our uh, alumni, one of the students who uh, participated in the first uh, iteration of our master's degree, 
uh, program did a project where he uh, used all kinds of really interesting methods uh, um, to monitor uh, the effect of coffee plantation on the movement of animals. He focused primarily on birds, uh, looked at the seed dispersal by those birds and so on. And he showed quite conclusively that uh, these coffee plantation really help with reforestation. And even okay. if we didn't have that project, if you go to Mount Gorongosa and you look at what used to be just bare, essentially burn wasteland, now there's a forest there. And it's, this is just, what, four or five years only. Yeah. So that project is working. We we also do other things, obviously, uh, with, uh, with our coffee project. We will be expanding uh, the involvement of science and, and education in this project. We have a, a whole bunch of ideas what to do. Uh, we have people who are working on uh, genetics of our uh, of our coffee. Uh, we will be focusing on some individual uh, groups of organisms uh, to see how they, uh, you know, interact with coffee. How how the uh, shade grown coffee helps them or not. Uh, we are also uh, one of our young scientists, uh, Norina Vicente, is mm -hmm. uh, leading a very interesting project. Uh, to see if we can employ local biocontrol agents to help help us keep uh, potential pests away from from the coffee, uh, you know, obviously our coffee is is organic. We don't use any pesticides or anything. Yeah. Uh, and for that reason, every now and then we have a, a, a small problem with with pests. Yeah, so pests, rather yeah. than relying on you know spraying or or some other uh, 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 unpleasant method. Uh, she is now testing the possibility that we can use one of our local ant species oh, uh, wow. to control, yeah, uh, to control outbreak of those pests, and it seems that it might be actually working. So, you know, this is just an example of one of the projects um, that we are um, that we are doing there. I, I see why science is important to every area. Actually, <laughs> it's not well, only the animals yeah. because. People only think, oh, science is only focused on, on the animals. So it's a bit of everything, actually. Definitely everything, yeah. Very, very interesting. So what what does a normal day look like for you in Gorongosa? Well, uh, while I'm teaching, and I'm teaching right now, uh, you know, most of my day is actually, unfortunately, spent in front of the computer because if I'm not lecturing, uh, then, then I'm looking at you know students' assignments or preparing the next lecture and so on. Uh, but again, as I said, I, I today is the last day of uh, this oh, one you. unit that I'm that I'm teaching, and then we have a break. Uh, so I will be able to go into the field. Um, so again, the day after tomorrow, we're taking our entire team, and we are driving uh, to the field. We will be driving to um, what we now call the. Zambezi region of Gorongosa, I believe that's the official name, uh, which is okay. uh, a place uh, that was formerly known as Kutada 12, a former mm -hmm. um, hunting concession that now is being administered by uh, by our national national park. And that's where we will be uh, working with the array of our remote cam cameras uh, that, that we use to monitor the movement of, of animals. We'll be setting up um, a weather station and we will okay. also be working on insects and on bats. Uh, these okay. two groups of animals are of great interest to me. And and um, uh, I work with our local scientists and students on several projects that involve these these, these animals. Oh, very nice. Um, since you're talking about bats. But before that, let me just um, say hello to everyone who's tuning in now. We are talking to Peter today. He's a scientist, photographer, writer, biologist, you name it. <laughs> um, so stay tuned. We have questions soon. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and, and write some questions. We'll ask Peter. And then at the end, obviously, we're going to have a winner. Um, so Peter, let's talk about bats. What, um, what do you think about the, the whole COVID-19 coming from bats? And what, what, what about the... Um, uh, the conspiracy theories that it's coming from a lab. What What are your thoughts, being a scientist? Well, I probably shouldn't swear in this public presentation. <laughs> Please so do not. I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to say it as politely as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all. Uh, this is all a bunch of. Yes. Holes. 
information. Let's put it okay. that way. Okay, please, uh, please so, educate us. Right. So uh, let's 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 talk about bats uh, for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So bats have been implicated as the source of uh, this particular coronavirus, which mm -hmm. is officially known as SARS V O two, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, SARS V two, um, uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh, some. Uh, uh, work by, by vir virologists have um, confirmed that, yes, uh, the populations of horseshoe bats, two species of the genus Rhinolophus, uh, that, that occur in the part of China where this uh, pandemic uh, initially started, are in fact carriers of coronaviruses. Not mm -hmm. the same coronaviruses that is now sweeping the globe, but related ones. Okay. Um, so it is very tempting to jump to the conclusion that these animals were the source of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, um, there is literally no evidence that that's the case. First of all, uh, those coronaviruses found in bats were not the same coronaviruses, they were different. We okay. still don't know who the source of that virus was uh, there, are, there were some suspects in, uh, uh, in the meantime. Uh, some blame was put on, at some point, the blame was put on snakes. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the blame shifted onto pangolins. But the fact is we still don't know uh, where that virus came. Now, bats are our default... Um, okay, well, let me put it this way. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you who the, who the source of coronavirus and any other uh, dangerous viruses is. It's an animal uh, that has a very variable uh, morphology. It's a, it's a polymorphic animal okay. and it's called the scapegoat. Um, scapegoat. And, yes. Um, okay. The source, the source of the coronavirus is the scapegoat. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, of course. Uh, we still don't know who the, who the, who the, who the actual source is. Um, but there is the more we look into it and the, the more we look in, at it in a dispassionate way, mm -hmm. the more we realize that bats are actually not the source and reservoirs of most of the viruses that uh, uh, that become, uh, you know, uh, diseases in, in a human population. There is, there is extremely little uh, evidence, direct evidence, that any, any spillovers, meaning uh, uh, a transmission of a disease from an animal to the human, happened uh, between bats and humans. Very, very few cases. So what um, she's saying is there is a corona or SARS in bats, and then we have yes, this one just, in humans, yeah, but they totally just different. Like in chickens, just like in chickens, pigeons. Okay. Uh, geese, ducks, dogs, uh, everywhere. Viruses occur in pretty much all animals. But of because course. we selectively focus on bats, we will find things in them. But it doesn't mean that bats have more coronaviruses or that they are more likely to cause a spillover and a pandemic than any other animal. The only virus that we have proof actually that you can actually contract from a bat is rabies. Okay. But, if you, but, but if you look at the incidence of rabies, um, you will quickly notice that bats are the least important source of rabies. You are more likely to get rabies from almost any other mammal. You can yeah. more likely get it from a horse than from a bat. So from bats God. are not guilty of anything. Have you seen the movie in, um, is it Infection? And uh, what is the, it called? There is a movie, um, oh, somehow are... very similar. Contagion is the movie. Contagion, yes. Yeah. Yes, I have seen that movie. What, what do you think yes, about the movie? Well, it was a great movie. But again, they, 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 they used what, what at the time science told them, that it's yeah. very likely that the SARS virus originated in bats. But again, we don't have a proof. What, what, what we see when virologists look at bats, what they find in bats is usually viral antibodies, which yeah. indicate that the bats have been exposed to viruses. 
but finding live viruses in bats is almost unheard of. We still actually never found uh, the Ebola virus in, 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 uh, in bats, but if you yeah. ask anybody who, who is the source of Ebola, everybody will tell you that it's the bats, but we haven't found it there yet. We need, we need so, somebody to blame. Yeah, we, yeah, we need the scapegoat. A scapegoat <laughs> is somebody we need, we put the blame on. Uh, that's why True. I said that. Uh, so anyway, sure. my, my general point is bat, bats are innocent. Bats probably have nothing to do with this particular pandemic. So you, uh, you are the bats lawyer. Well, yeah, you can call me that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I definitely support let's them. Go, let's go to the questions. We have questions from uh, two people at the moment. We have one from Kelly and uh, it says, in your time in the field, what was one of your most exciting or dangerous encounters with any of the creatures you study? Okay, well, I study singing insects. They are not particularly dangerous. <laughs> so the worst encounter I ever had with them is like one bit me on the finger. That's it. But however, I did have a few very interesting close calls and one in particular uh, happened a couple of years ago here in Gorongosa, where uh, with my colleague, uh, with my Mozambican colleague, uh, uh, Tongai, we were in the field uh, with a pangolin. There was a mm -hmm. pangolin that was rescued from poachers. And the way you take care of pangolin before you release them into the wild, you have to, because it, was, it wasn't in very good shape, we let them feed on termites. So pangolins yeah. feed on termites. So you every day you had to take it in the field and just let it roam freely feeding on termites. So that's what we were doing. We were standing, uh, watching it, uh, watching over this pangolin on a big termite mound. And suddenly we realized there is a big herd of elephants coming toward us. Ooh. And as you probably ver know very well, Larissa, uh, you have to be afraid of elephants in Gorongosa. <laughs> they they remember Where what happened, you know, <laughs> 20 years ago. And they, they are often quite aggressive toward people. So we were terrified because we were cut off from our car. There were elephants between us and our car. And the, and car, the only wow. way to escape was in that big termite month on which we were standing, there was a huge warthog hall, you know, okay. the, the big hall made by these wild, wild well, pigs. So mm -hmm. that's what we did. Uh, um, Tongai and I, we jumped into that hall and sat in that warthog hall while the elephants were walking all around us and feeding right above our heads. So that was that was quite a thrilling moment because A, we didn't know if there were warthogs or maybe snakes in that hall while they oh, were right. in that hall. Uh, and at, at any moment, those elephants could have detected us and they would have probably trampled us to death. So oh, yeah. that, that was kind of interesting. The, the, the really cool part was that after we uh, after the elephants left and we came out of the hall, we obviously st uh, immediately started looking for a pangolin and he was just sitting there feeding as if nothing <laughs> Chilly. happened. Chilly. Yeah. Lucky at you guys, most probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we have another question from Teresa. Um, the question says, do you think that COVID-19 can be an opportunity to endangered animals um, like bats yeah. and in particular pangolins? I sincerely hope so. I sincerely hope so. And and um, uh, one of the most positive uh, uh, aspects of this uh, tragic pandemic is that there is a huge pressure to shut down trade in wild animals. Uh, yeah. We already know. We've known that for a very long time that a lot of uh, uh, infectious diseases start by us consuming wild animals. That's yeah. how the zoonotic disease, diseases jump from animal populations to us. So if we can stop trade in bushmeat, illegal hunting, selling and eating wild animals, it would be a tremendous benefit uh, to wildlife worldwide. So yes, I'm hoping that we will learn the lesson and stop um, w harvesting in an un completely uh, uh, uncontrollable way uh, wildlife of, of our planet. So yes, I'm hoping that there will be a positive impact of it. With bats, I am not so sure if the, because again, there is so much misinformation. There is so much misunderstanding about the role of bats. And again, yeah. let me emphasize, bats are innocent. They are not responsible for this pandemic. However, <laughs> people 
you know people don't don't spend time trying to understand anything they just they just react they look for an easy scapegoat and there's nothing easier than some animals that flies in the dark that nobody knows and about and nobody likes so so i'm not sure what the impact on on bats can be one thing i would like to say that there is actually much greater risk to the bats from us right now because there is a very potential a very uh, real uh, threat of us transmitting uh, this coronavirus onto local bat populations. So for this reason, it is recommended that bat biologists stop handling bats right now until okay. we know whether we can actually transmit them on those animals. We really don't want to introduce this virus into bat populations. Oh, thank you. Um, it's it's <laughs> interesting how um, the bats lawyer talks about them. <laughs> thank you for continue to educate us in that in that sense. Uh, we have sure. one last question and it's from Ava. And she says, can you speak a bit, uh, can you speak about the bioacoustics work you are doing at the park? Sure, hi Ava. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, bioacoustics, it's a, it's a fan, fan, phenomenal topic. Uh, it's, the, it's the science of sound, uh, a science of biological sounds. We are using bioacoustics uh, in many different ways. Um, uh, for example, we are using it as a tool that tells us about uh, the composition of biodiversity in Gorongosa. We are just about to deploy an array of uh, automated, uh, automated uh, sound recorders, uh, just like we are using remote cameras that take pictures every time an animal moves in front of it, and that allows us to, to trace the movement of animals. Uh, we can do the same with sound and we can apply the same method to, to organisms that are otherwise very difficult to monitor, such as birds that live in the canopy of the forest or bats that fly at night. By using sound, we can track their movement, we can look at what's happening with the population, we can also detect new things. We, can, we are hoping to use our acoustic array to monitor perhaps the arrival of new species of bats or perhaps new species of insects uh, into the, the Gorongosa uh, uh, populations. So it's, it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, we are also looking at some more uh, esoteric questions. Uh, for example, our, one of our young scientists, scientist uh, Laura, uh, will be looking in the population genetics of a particular mm -hmm. Uh, species of a singing katydids, and she will be using the sound as one of her tools uh, okay. to see how uh, these different populations interact. Perhaps there is, uh, they are two different, what's called cryptic species, or perhaps there is, they are in the process of uh, hybridization and so on. So there, there are a lot of different, uh, very interesting questions that you can ask using uh, using sound and, and and answer those questions. Oh wow, that's interesting. Um, I think uh, I'm starting to get this feeling of becoming a scientist one of these days. You think that's well, still possible? Of, of course it is possible. It's <laughs> never too late. Never, ever. Good. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to start hanging out more with you. Please. <laughs> the, the lab is that our lab is extremely welcoming. Anybody can come here at any time. If you want to be part of our science team, you are more than welcome. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Peter. Um, please give uh, any last considerations, any hellos, any shout outs before we close up, please. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. <laughs> I hope they're watching. I'm sure they are watching. <laughs> oh, great. Great. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. Um, our winner today. Can we have some drum rolls, Peter? Great. So our winner today is Teresa. Well done, Teresa. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, Peter, this was awesome. I learned a lot today, especially about bats. Um, I know that you're the, the lawyer now, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more careful what I say about bats. Um, everyone, see you next week. Same time, same place. And stay safe. Stay at home. And in good taste, always. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Larissa. Bye, everybody.